Welcome into and another edition of NHL Tonight First Shift. EJ Raddick alongside Bill Lindsay. Eight games on the docket today for a Monday, October the 28th, 2024. Billy, glad to have you back with me. Nice to be back. Yeah. Enjoyable. Yeah. We put, oh, we put the fun. Florida Panthers jersey up for you. Thank They're you. in action tonight. They are. So uh, fittingly, we put that one up for you. But I guess first things first, we have to start with the news of the day and what will be of the evening. Steven Stamkos making his first regular season appearance. They didn't play there in the preseason, so it'll be his first appearance wearing a different jersey and a dramatically different jersey. The uh, Natural Predators as they come to town to take on the Tampa Bay Lightning. It's going to be an emotional night, I would think, for the longtime captain of the Lightning to return now as a member of the Natural Predators. You see it there going back to 2008, Billy. He was the first overall pick, part of a championship team there. Rocket Richard trophies, leads them in games, goals, points. It's going to be a lot of emotion in that building. There will be. He's a legend and will be forever in Tampa Bay, and he's going to get a round of applause and a standing ovation that's deserving. And it's never going to, the legacy is never going to end. It will always be cemented there with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Steven Stamkos is probably happy that it's happen, happening early in the season. I'm going to get it behind me. We can move yeah. forward. He only sees the Tampa Bay twice. This one's going to be back in Tampa Bay. But what he meant to the Lightning over the years with the Stanley Cup championships on and off the ice, pretty much everything. They've had to make tough decisions in Tampa. Tampa. Julian Breesbaugh has not shied away from it. And Steven Stamkos is the latest one that they move on. And you realize that hockey is a business. But tonight is a night to celebrate the greatness that was Steven Stamkos in Tampa Bay. The Stanley Cups, the memories. Those will last forever. And that old statement, we win today, we walk together forever. Well, they did it a couple of times. And that group that was together in that time frame with St Steven Samkos, that is a family. And it will always be a family and it will never be broken up. Tonight, let's have at it and let's give him all the accolades he deserves. Yeah, if we went to the, I guess that hit, Steven Samkos, as a member of the Lightning, took four trips to the Cup Final. Mm -hmm. If my memory serves me correctly, they won the back-to-back -back Cups. You were down there in South Florida. The Florida Panthers now have become, you know, a, a team that uh, have you have to reckon with, defending Stanley Cup champions in their own right, two straight years in the final. But you saw us that that rivalry with Tampa and Florida over mm -hmm. many, many years, and you saw Stamkos' career from the beginning and and how he really made his name with the Tampa Bay Lightning. Did you ever think that he would leave? You never understand at the start. You, you, you see the career and the trajectory at five, ten years. You say, never, never going to happen. Yeah. But it, once it starts to evolve and different gets later in last year and it becomes maybe that's a chance, uh, it starts to creep into your mind. But in the early years, as successful as he was, he said, this guy's a Tampa Bay Lightning forever. But I thought the same thing when Jonathan Huberto Kind of started his career with yeah. the Florida Panthers, got off to that great start, and that's he, right. He gets uh, traded early. I yeah. thought, well, Huberto is going to break every Panther record that we ever had. Ever had yeah. So you just never know in, in this business where it's going to head or where it's going to trend. And Wayne Gretzky got traded. We know that that's story. Right. Uh, so Steven Stamkos, I never saw it happening, but it did. It did happen. He's moved on. The Tampa Bay Lightning have to move on. He has to do the best in his new situation, Tampa Bay. Is trying to stay in that window, trying to win a cup, and we'll see what happens. Uh, it's been a struggle so far in Nashville. Has 28 shots on net, the only one goal to show for it. New line mates. It takes time to adjust. I believe it will happen, and the fit will be better for Steven Samkos in Tampa Bay. Or sorry, in, in Nashville. Nashville. Yeah. Uh, but it all comes down to tonight and the one game, playing it, <laughs> getting it over with, and trying to. Trying to move forward. It's going to be good to put this game behind him. He's behind probably him. thought about it a lot. And it's like today, is, I'm sure, we're going to have Dave Michigan on a little bit mm -hmm. later, the radio play, by vo play voice of the Tampa Bay Lighting, to kind of put it in perspective a little bit. But I'm sure this has been on his mind. And for a long right. time. I think it'll be good for him to, to, to get this, through it. And once he gets through, through this, maybe you'll start to see yeah. Steven Samkos. Maybe this has been on his mind yeah. right at the start of the season here, here. The, the Looking Tampa, ahead. Yeah, this Tampa Bay game. Okay, now it's behind us. Nashville has climbed back, won three games in a row. Start to piece it together. Stamkos gets better and better. I believe yeah. that's going to be the same thing with this Nashville team. They'll continue yeah. 
that trajectory upward. Because this was, a, I mean, you, you said it, I mean, to lose their first five games. I mean, everybody's talking about Nashville's going to be way better this year. They made these acquisitions, Marcia So and Brady Shea and Stamkos, and they finished last year pretty good. 0-5 out of the mm -hmm. gate, but they have won their last three. So they're looking at this. Yeah, it's nice to win for Steven. I'm sure there'll be a lot of money. He'll have a lot of money on the board. <laughs> the board yeah. It'd be great to see if he scores against his former teammates. But, can, you know, they need to win. They do. And their system has been good. What Andrew Burnett does, they spend a lot of time in the offensive zone, and the analytics look okay. But the problem that Nashville is having is that they're not getting the puck into the slot, into the meaty areas. they got to find a way to get the puck into that inner slot, those scoring high danger areas, and that's where Stamkos has to get involved more, get into that slot, try and find those right line combinations. There's something on the bone in Nashville. If you kind of look at the underlying numbers, yeah. it's getting closer. They're getting better at what they want to do, but they're still controlling the pace of play. Saros is starting to take an uptick. The goaltending's getting better. The defense, Shea has looked good the last couple of games. We know what Roman Yossi is capable of. So I, I still believe Nashville is going to be relevant in the playoff conversation at the end of the year. Yeah, so Preds and Lightning tonight down there in Tampa. And uh, your team, the Florida Panthers, they're in action tonight as well. They take on the Buffalo Sabres, a hot Sabres team. They've won three in a row. Panthers play tonight and then right on the plane to Finland where they'll go play the Global Series games against the Dallas Stars coming up on Friday and Saturday. I'll be calling those games right here on the NHL Network alongside Steve Conroy. But... Let me ask you, what do you think of your Panthers so far? I got to see them Thursday at the Garden. Uh, I thought they played very well against the Rangers. They got great goal tonight that night. Bobrovsky won his 400th career game, became the youngest goalie ever to wear the, in the fewest games to win 400. Pretty amazing stuff. But what do you make of your Panthers so far? They've been without Barkov, who does come back tonight, so that's great news. They missed Kachuk for a while, but here they are. Seem fine. Mm -hmm. The coaching, Paul Maurice, the systems. This is year number three under the systems. Kachuk goes down, Barkov goes down. Lundell plays extremely well, elevated You were role. saying he's going to break Lowe's out Serena. this year. You said I, did, I did say that. But yeah. what happens now with Kachuk and Barkov back into the lineup, that top nine, it's the best top nine in the NHL, in my personal opinion, because you can rotate it all along, along different options for Paul Maurice. But what he's done with the systems, the forechecking, it's dump, Rims all the time, get hard on the puck. They play a left wing or a lock, a wing lock in the neutral zone, and you never vary from it. So you plug and place all the players there in the Panthers uniform. When they step on the ice, maybe the first year under Paul Maurice, that's why it took a while, because there was th some thinking involved. Now there is no thinking. They know exactly where they're sp supposed to be on the ice at all times and because of that it's just read and react and the last thing you want to do as a hockey player is think and uh, it's a very a, a system that's dialed in to a T they execute it they, 10 games they play two bad games mm -hmm. one in Buffalo they get a chance for redemption and a home game against Minnesota so if you come back after a Stanley Cup and you've had only two duds in what you've lost the other eight games, you've played extremely hard you've played well that's what you're looking for they came back their fitness levels were at or above where they were at last year. And the compete in the locker room is self-containing. That locker room, Paul Maurice knows, I don't have to go in there. Those guys understand what the level has to be. And it starts with a Barkov, with a Kachuk. They're going to bring everyone along. Paul Maurice sets out the game plan. I got the players in that locker room that are going to execute it and are going to hold everyone to a very, very high standard. And you got some new pieces, too. I mean, so how? Let me ask you quick about Samuskevich. Is like he's a draft pick, mm -hmm. young player. He got his first goal the other day. Is he going to be part of this moving forward? Where do you think he's at in his development? He has to be in some capacity. They need players on entry level contracts to come in and make an impact. And he's played well. He's got all kinds of offensive upside. Didn't get a lot to show for it. He had a really good. We had that three game homestand, and he played extremely well against Vancouver and against Vegas. Got his first assist. You could see it kind of lighten the load, and it was coming. It was coming. It was getting closer. Then up against the New York Islanders, hit the post, and then finally on that wraparound yep. attempt, he's got all kinds of offensive skill. And the advantage you have with a player like Sam Miskevich, with all the offensive skill, if you get him into a fourth-line role and play him, give him eight, nine, ten minutes, and he grows, shows that he can play the defensive side of the puck, now move him up with Lundell, Luo, Serenin. Those guys have a complete 200-foot game. 
So Samuskevich, play your offensive style. We got two players that kind kind of cover up for you, but there there is a lot to be unearthed with Samuskevich. And there is a lot of potential there that could really, if you get him thrust into a lineup, could really bolster this Panther team. All right, real quick, we got to check in on the Winnipeg Jets, too. They're playing Toronto tonight. That'll be uh, the talk of Canada, I'm <laughs> sure. But the Jets, 8-0, and and their power play has been lighting it up. And if you watch their power play, you've got Ehlers on the top power play unit, which wasn't there last year. But they don't dump the puck in. And it's, it's amazing to watch. Uh, that point percent is just stuck right out there. That's pretty thousand, good, right? <laughs> Last time I checked, a thousand percent is really, or one, you know, whatever, however you want to say it, they're perfect so far. Yeah. But if you do that and you go back and watch their power play, they've only dumped it in seven percent of the time. That means they're gaining zone entries, and they're seventh best at the NHL in controlled entries on the power play. They're getting in the zone. They're getting set up. When you're able to do that, you're allowed to get that power play to work, and they're working it side to side and getting it down into the middle. There's a lot of different options. You got Morrissey back on the point, uh, Shifley, and uh, Cole Perfetti. I like the addition with Cole Perfetti not having to worry. This Finding year. his way now, yeah. getting us yeah. earning a spot, yeah. right? And he's he's comfortable yeah. uh, where he's at. And Scott Arneal, their defensive numbers haven't slipped much. So they, their offense still continues to click along. But we're the bread and butter with the Winnipeg Jets. In my personal opinion, will and always will be, is their defensive structure and their goaltending. Goaltending, yeah. Connor Hellebuck, an amazing run. And the Jets have won 16 consecutive regular season games going back to last year. They finished the season on an eight-game run. They've won their first eight this year. You can see the numbers there. I mean, over the course of a couple of seasons there, I mean, they're only one behind the Pittsburgh <laughs> Penguins. Uh, Mark That'd be a 17. pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's odd because when you have it over the course of two years, you forget about they won because you forget about it because they they didn't play well in the postseason. Colorado took them out in five games, so we'll see if they can up the ante this year. As for the Leafs, started out okay. It's been a little struggle lately. Their power play just the opposite, not getting anything done. They did get Jake McCabe signed to a contract. This is an important spot for the Leafs tonight. It is important, in Winnipeg. but it's early on. But if we were in game number 40 and the Leafs over a nine-game stretch went 4-4-1 four, four, and one or something, yeah. like, we wouldn't have no issues. This yeah. Leaf team is going to be fine. Craig Berube, new systems. It takes a while. I know Craig Berube called out Mitch Marner mm. and Austin Matthews made a statement. we got to be a little bit better. This team has all the makings. They're going to be good. The question is always – they're going to be a playoff team. Yeah. The question always arises at the playoffs – can this group that's been together and assembled together for so long get it done when it matters most? I'm not worried about the, the Toronto Maple Leafs and the, the caliber that they have up front. Their defense are still pretty stacked. Uh, the additions they made, Oliver ekman Larson coming in, McCabe. These, these players that they have, and under Craig Berube, a more demanding coach, it all matters. Does it translate at the end of the year into playoff success. Yeah, so Toronto and Winnipeg tonight. Jets going for nine in a row. Probably say the same thing about both teams. Can they get it done in the playoffs? A long way to go before we get to April. We come back. The Minnesota Wild have gotten off to a good start. And their GM, Billy Guerin, he's doing double duty working for Team USA and the Wild. We'll talk to Billy about all that coming up next on First Ship. Here's a look at the Central Division standings, and Minnesota Wild off to a terrific start. Five, one, and two through those first eight games, and no better time to bring on their general manager, Billy Guerin. And, uh, you know, Billy, I, I appreciate you taking the time today, and I want to get to the Minnesota Wild, but I have a couple other things I wanted to talk about with you in terms of USA hockey. Uh, but I do want to start. I saw today you were you were giving Sidney Crosby the gears a little bit there, going in and into the, the presser today. Was that today? Uh, yeah, that was today. That was today. <laughs> any, any chance I get, uh, I, I like to give him a hard time. So just having some fun. Cause I, the only reason I bring it up is cause you're known as a guy that you have a big personality. You're, you, you know, your former teammates would say you want a Stanley cup together, but you, you're, you're a little bit of a, a guy that likes to joke and, and have fun. Was that some, have you always been that guy? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I really have. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's just, 
Yes. <laughs> to just answer your question, yeah. And it's and look, we're so lucky to be in this in this league and yep. this game and this world that uh, you know. And there's so many great people around, and you know, I, I played on a lot of teams, so I have a lot of friends out there, and it's just it's just fun to you know be in this environment and this culture. I love it. I, you know, I, I do think it's important because there's so much tension, and you know, guys are is competing all the time, and it's tough. It's tough to win. It is nice to have a little levity. I know when you came on the scene in Pittsburgh there and helped that team, that was a big part of helping that team get over the hump a little bit is just to ease that tension a bit. Yeah, I, you know what? The, this There's so much pressure um, on the players and on the coaches and the management, everybody. Um, and, and a lot of the pressure, the, you know, the guys put that on themselves. And they want to succeed. They want to do well. And when things aren't going well, sometimes you need a little levity to just kind of break it up. And um, yeah, and I, I just think if if people are, are are a little more at ease, they're having a little more fun. It's better than being tense, yeah. and it's better than gripping your stick. So you you got to be able to laugh. And hey, look, there is a time, and I think you know we've known each other long enough, and you yeah. know people that know me. When it's time to when it's time to be serious and buckle down. Yeah. I'll do it. We'll, we'll we'll do it. But there are times there are times to laugh and and uh, laugh at yourself and you know poke fun at others and just have a good time. So uh, you just got to find the balance. And hey, it doesn't work for everybody, but it, that's just worked for me. All right. So I saw you the other night uh, at the game. You're scouting for Team USA. You're you're the GM of the of the team at Four Nations team coming up, and also the Olympic team in in 2026. It's a great honor, I'm sure, for you to be in charge of these things. You're trying to put the team together. You have several. You have a, a large group of people with you. Your coaches and other managers. What are you guys looking for? What are you looking for putting together a team? Because you got a lot to choose from right now. There's a big pool of really good American players. What are you looking for when you're putting this group together? We're trying to put together the best team, um, not just take, uh, you know, the best players or, or, you know, who people think are the best players or the most popular. We're trying to put together the best team. Um, we, we have to have players that, you know, who are normally stars on their NHL team. Uh, we're going to need guys to buy into roles. Uh, we're going to need guys to accept that you know, maybe they won't play the the same amount of minutes that they they're they're used to, but that buy-in is going to be incredibly important. Um, we need guys that are going to fill certain roles: power play, penalty kill. Um, you know, all all sorts of situations. So, I think that's the main thing that we're looking at is is what's the best team, um, and how are we going to fill all these different roles. Where do you think your toughest choices will be? I mean, because, again, it's a large pool of players. Is it up front? Is it on the blue line? Is it in goal? Where do you think your toughest choices will come? Oh, boy. They're, they're tough all over. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you know, we, we look at a, a big depth chart of, of all the U.S.-born players, and, you know, the, the one thing is, is that there, there will be some disappointment. And that's the one thing that stinks about this job is, 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 having to deliver some bad news uh, to, to certain players. But um, look at, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity coming up in the next couple of years. Four nations is this year. Olympics is next year. There's always world championships. There's, there's a bunch of opportunity to play for, for your country. Um, but I, I think just, it's really tough to pinpoint what position we're, you know, having the hardest time with it. It's there's just difficult decisions all over the place. Yeah, that's it's that's a good problem to have because you do have a wealth of talent now in the U.S. to choose from. So that will be uh, probably an interesting part of it for you. Does it help? I would imagine it must help you that you participated in three Olympics. You were part of World Cup of Hockey on a couple of occasions. You won the, you were part of, the, I believe, that 96 team that won the World Cup. You're a silver medalist at the Olympics in 2002. Does it help that you were part of all these things and understand the dynamic of putting together a best-on-best -best team that plays in a really short window? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have experience um you know and that's what like when i talked about the buy-in before that's what we had on that 96 world cup team was was incredible buy-in from guys to to do certain things to maybe play a role that you're not used to playing um do all those things just for the the better of the team um you know look at we're we're they're big stakes we're playing for our country it's more, 
more important than the than the individual. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know if it gives me an, an advantage, but it just gives me a different perspective on it. All right, let's get to your Minnesota Wild team that's off to a really good start this year. I want to go back to the start of your tenure there because, I mean, you made you, you made a really big decision on those buyouts of Zach Parisi and Ryan Suter. I mean, those were those were big decisions. There's a lot of financial repercussions to that that you're still dealing with. I think you got one more year of that. When you go back to that, would you still do it the same way? Yeah, I would. And, you know, I, I always say it wasn't – I think the buyouts were, were – they're always coming to the forefront because those guys are such great players from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they did a lot of great things there, but we had to change a lot. Not mm -hmm. just those two guys. Um, it, it, you know, we moved out a bunch of guys. We needed to create change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they had a good run there, but it, it was time to kind of turn the page and, and move on to something new. And, and that was just part of it. But, um, you know, Dean Evison did a great job coaching for us for a while. Now we've got John Hines kind of putting his stamp on the team right now. Uh, players that have been here for a while are in, in, you know, leadership positions. We've brought in a bunch of new players. And, um, you know, Minnesota's a great place to play. And, uh, you know, we got a full building every night. It's a great atmosphere. It's a, a great hockey market, as everybody knows. So um, there, there are a lot of good things, uh, you know, about playing in Minnesota. No question about that. Let me, let me ask you about uh, Kirill Kaprizov. How good is he? You've played with all kinds of great players. Um, he is, he is elite. He really is, and I think he's got a lot of the same attributes that that Sidney Crosby has, in that it, like his practice habits are incredible. His details is incredible. His his will to win is incredible. The condition that he comes in a training camp. Um, and he pushes guys. He expects excellence. Uh, you know, I, I think Kirill's an, uh, one of the elite players in this league. And th the main thing on Kirill's mind is winning. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants to do. I think he's got world championships. He's got a gold medal from the Olympics. He wants a Stanley Cup. Yeah, they are all the great players. You have two of them. So, I mean, that's what they're all looking for. That's what you want. The guys that want to win above and beyond everything else. Uh, how do you feel about your team so far? It's been a really good start. You had that stretch where you didn't trail in any games. Obviously, you know, you're not going to win all 82. You end up uh, losing to Philly the other day in kind of a crazy game. How do you feel about your team so far? Because it has been a very good start. It's, it's been a good start. Um, but, you know, like, like a GM should say, I think it's just a start. We have a long <laughs> way to go. Um, but no, I'm proud of the way the teams, uh, you know, got through camp. They're 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 buying into what John is 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 teaching them. Um, they're they're they they've really changed the way that they're uh, thinking through the game, um, and and it's it's paid off for us in the early part of the season. We've gotten great goaltending from both our goaltenders. Uh, you know, we're we're getting scoring. So, uh, you know, hey, look the the. The trick is now that to, that we have to keep it up, and we can't take our foot off the gas pedal. So um, this is kind of when we have to push the guys even a little harder. All right, so you got Pittsburgh tomorrow night. Should be a really an emotional night for for Mark Andre Fleury. You were a teammate of his, as I mentioned earlier. You won a Stanley Cup there. You were part of management there. You bring in Fleury to Minnesota. What do you think it's going to mean for the for the fans there in Pittsburgh? You you know that fan base, and also for Mark Andre tomorrow night and his probably his farewell appearance in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and uh, I hope he's just playing on emotion. I hope he's on a real high, uh, so we can get the two points. But I, I just think the the city of Pittsburgh, the the Penguins fans, have just a, a great love affair with this guy, and for good reason. Um, he's been he was a big part of their community. He was a big part of the Penguins for a long time, bringing championships, and he did it all with a smile on his face. So I, I'm sure it's going to be a great night for the fans. And I, I know Flower is going to soak it all in and, and really enjoy it. All right. Penguins and Wild tomorrow night in Pittsburgh. Billy, thanks so much for your time. I know you're bouncing around and you're busy with all the stuff with USA Hockey. Good luck during the year, and hopefully we'll catch up with you again down the road. I always got time for you, buddy. You know oh, that. Thanks. You're too nice. You're too. By the way, I was able to get that uh, ink off that pass the other night. So I know you put a nice little beard on me, but... 
I was able to get that off there. Yeah, you, it just looked like your pet. You needed a little facial hair I did. on there to go. I did. I think you know what? I I probably should have just left it. Probably should have left it on. <laughs> you should have. I I was actually a little upset that you <laughs> that you wiped it off. <laughs> next time. Next time. Billy, right. good luck, buddy. Thanks. All right, the great Billy Guerin, GM of the Minnesota Wild. Coming up next, hey, we're going to have Dave Michigan join us, radio voice of the Tampa Bay Lightning, to talk about the big night back in Tampa. Steven Stamkos returns as a predator. That's next on First Shift. Steven Stamkos. He was the Bolts. Bolts fans who saw him go first overall and thought, boy, we hope he can change our franchise. He's done that. Number 60 for Steven Stamkos. What an accomplishment. For his time as a Tampa Bay Bull, he was the standard bearer. What he meant to the Tampa Bay Lightning will never be forgotten. My goodness, right out of a storm. You think about Steven Stamkos, you think of that incredible shot. He's one of the modern era's greatest goal scorers. Steven Stamkos with goal number 500. He is the best ever to wear the Lightning sweater. He's a bona fide offensive threat. And Steven Stamkos has done it for the first time in the history of the Tampa Bay Lightning. 1,000 points. He's just a picture perfect guy as the face of a franchise. And with that, we bring in, well, first we'll take a look at the career stats of Mr. Steven Stankos, 555 goals, and all these numbers with the Lightning. He has now moved on to Nashville. And with that, we will bring in Dave Mishkin, who is the radio voice of the Tampa Bay Lightning, has been doing that for quite a while now. You've done, now, you've done all of Steven Stankos' games, I assume, as a member of the Lightning. Yes. So this will be, so how weird is this for you tonight? It is pretty weird. And, you know, the Lightning and Predators typically play two games in the preseason, one in each location. The game in Nashville, Stamkos did not play. I'm not surprised that he didn't. And then twice the game was postponed in Tampa due to the storm. So I don't think he was going to play in that game either. So this is my first time seeing him in a different uniform. It'll be it'll be weird, but that is I am way down on the list in terms of <laughs> people feeling weird about this. Probably yeah. the top of the list is Steven Stamkos, who had yeah. to enter Amelie Arena this morning. You know, he went to the visitor's locker room, yeah. which I'm sure felt very weird for him. And it's going to be an emotional day for him. He met with the, the media this morning, and he was asked kind of, what are your emotions going to be like tonight? And he's like, I'm not quite sure. And he knows there's going to be a video tribute. He's been through enough of these for former teammates of his who have come back to play a home game, to play a game at Amelie Arena as a visitor. And the Lightning do a very good job of getting the emotions stirred up. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes there's a tear in the eye, and, and this one is probably going to be at the top of the list. Uh, it's hard to, to overstate what he has meant to this franchise, both on and off the ice. Try and overstate it for us, Dave. <laughs> what has he well, meant to this well, okay. franchise over the years? So let me put it to you this way, Bill. Steven Stamkos played with the Tampa Bay Lightning until 2024. 32 years of the franchise, Stamkos was here for 16 of them. So his time with the Lightning was half the life of the franchise. And most of those stats that you put up, he's number one in franchise history. He clearly had a huge impact on the ice, but he had an outsized influence off the ice too. Off the ice in the locker room as a captain, I mean, Hockey players are are good guys for the most part. They really are. Hockey captains tend to carry themselves very well. I mean, he was the Lightning's captain for a decade, basically. Yeah. But I've been around other captains. I'm not sure I've been around a better captain, at least one that has I've had access to on a regular basis. But even beyond that, you know, his work in the community, he was a great ambassador for this franchise. When he arrived in 2008, Things looked a lot different in Lightning Land than they do now. Uh, the team had trouble filling the building. The brand was 
was nowhere. Jeff Fennick bought the team in 2010 and things started to, to trend upward and trend upward quickly. But Stammer was here for the, the dark times too and helped really pull this franchise up in terms of cachet, right? Yeah. Like now they're one of the most well-regarded franchises in the NHL and in the world of sports. And Stamp Ghost has kind of been at the forefront of that. So on the ice, huge impact off the ice, huge impact. And just a, a great person too. <laughs> like you won't meet a nicer fellow than, than Steven Stamp Ghost. You can ask any of his former teammates or current teammates yeah. what they think of them. Dave, what's your, what was your favorite Stamkos moment? You got to call all these games, all these great moments. I have one that stuck out, it stuck out for me, but like you called all the games, so maybe it'll be something different. What was your favorite Stamkos moment? Well, I have a pretty good story for you guys. Mm -hmm. So it was two years ago, he scored his 500th regular season goal in Vancouver, and uh, our, our beat writer for the Tampa Bay Times reached out to me because I had called all of his games. Mm -hmm. And he said, could you give me a list of your top five Stamkos moments goals or otherwise mm -hmm. so it came up with a list of five we were still we were out in the west coast we were in western canada and i came up with the list i hadn't sent it yet and i took the elevator down to the lobby and who was standing in the lobby stamp goes mm -hmm. <laughs> so i went up to him like hey i i just got this request for these five plays can i run them by you and see what you think mm. he's like yeah fine so i gave him <laughs> five he's like hmm what about Dallas in the bubble? I'm like, <laughs> I forgot on that one. So that was the one I forgot. I put it on there. That was number one. Yeah. I mean, he missed the entire playoff. Yeah. He was an injury. He came in for two minutes and 47 seconds, I think it was, in game yeah. three. Played maybe four shifts, scored a goal. And it yeah. was just such an uplifting moment for the team. The series was 1-1 at that point. Lightning won game three. They ended up winning the series in six. So that was definitely at the top of the list. But there have been plenty of, of other great moments. I mean, you had it, you had a lot of them in that intro segment, yeah. but his 60th goal that he scored in Winnipeg, it was in 2012. The Lightning were missing the playoffs. This was their final regular season game in a weird twist. Atlanta had moved to Winnipeg, and in that one year, Winnipeg and the Lightning were in the same division, so they had to go there more than once. That got rectified soon after. But we finished the regular season in Winnipeg, and Stamkos was sitting at 59 goals, and the crowd was, like, razzing him every single time. He was on the ice, touching the puck. He didn't score in the first. He didn't score in the second. We're, like, halfway through the third. He's still sitting at 59. Then he scored the goal, and uh, the crowd gave him a standing ovation, nice. which props to the Winnipeg faithful. But that was pretty memorable because it, yeah. it really went right down to the wire, you know. But he got to 60. Yeah. Lots of memories, Dave. Uh, just on the flip side of it, a lot of tough decisions that have had to been made over the years with the Stanley Cup runs. Uh, Julian Breesbaugh, a tough one with Stephen Stamkos. Yeah. We're going to celebrate Stephen Stamkos tonight. But talk about going through all these hard decisions and keeping this team relevant year after yeah. year and the job that Julian Breesbaugh has done there in Tampa Bay. Well, Julian has not been one to let Moss grow on a stone. Like he's he's been active at the at the deadline, and it's not always like he's active. He is active to try and give his team a chance to win just about every year. But a lot of his activity has has you know resulted in players coming to the Lightning organization who are still near the beginning of their career. And the guy in the middle right there, Brandon Hagel, is a great example. They also acquired Nick Paul that same deadline. 2022 but you know at the time they acquired Hagel who's 24 years old now they gave up a couple of first round picks for him but they gave up the prospect basically not to use that term loosely but you know you don't know what you're going to get in a first round pick they knew what they were getting in Brandon Hagel he was already established in the NHL and they they inked him to a long-term deal shortly thereafter same with Nick Paul who was a little bit older but still kind of in the earlier part of his career. So one way they've been able to do it, Bill, is target current NHLers that they have acquired via trade that are still near the beginning of their careers, as some of these other guys have, have moved on just due to the contract situation, the cap situation, whether it was Tyler Johnson or Alex Kalorn or Barkley Goodrow or Blake Coleman, Yanni Gord, they lost in the expansion draft, Andre Palat. I mean, the list is fairly extensive, but what they've been able to do to really keep their window open is to 
to kind of fill their roster because they don't have draft picks, right? <laughs> they haven't had a lot of high draft picks. So they've been able to fill their roster with guys who are in the NHL that they've scouted who are near the beginning of their careers, relatively speaking, and then lock these guys up. And, and I think we've seen that time and time again. The core, though, is still intact. You know, you still have Braden Point, you still have Kucherov, you still have Hedman, you still have Vasilevsky. Sorelli was on that list. You know, he's still in his 20s. So they're very happy with kind of the makeup of their team. This offseason was different. It wasn't that they brought in lots of new players, but some of the players that they brought in are going to be and are getting significant roles. Mm -hmm. So that is the change. So, you know, Stamkos is no longer on the team. Sergachev is no longer on the team. Two guys that came in, Jake yeah. Gensel via free agency, J.J. Moser in the Sergachev trade, like they have been given large roles, significant roles with this team. And the Lightning feel very good about kind of the makeup of where they are at with with these two guys coming in well it's been a pretty good start they've won five of their first eight they got nashville tonight it's going to be an emotional night for sure we'll all be watching and uh you'll be on the call i'll be i'll be curious to hear your call and how you approach things tonight because there's going to be a lot of juice in that building so have a great night and thanks so much for the time dave we really appreciate it thank you dave Anytime, guys take care all right dave michigan play-by-play -play voice on the radio for the Tampa Bay Lightning. We come back, gonna take a, a look out west. The Hurricanes and the Canucks out in Vancouver. It should be a good one out west. We'll talk that next on First Shift. Here is a look at the early season comparison board of the Carolina Hurricanes and the Vancouver Canucks. They meet tonight out west and you can see both teams off to a pretty good start. Canes finishing up a six game road trip Billy four and one hmm. through the first five. So they I mean if they could win tonight to go out on the road with a team people talked about Carolina's lost some personnel this year maybe not going to be as good. If they could finish this with a win in Vancouver against a good Canucks team, come home 5-1, and one, that'd be a nice flight back. It would. They didn't lose the coach, did they? No. Rod <laughs> Brindamore or no, the didn't. systems. No. And they play the exact same way. Mm -hmm. They dominate with the offensive zone time, get it low to high, pressure. Their sticks are still the best in the league. With puck on stick. They don't hit you a lot. They don't use the body. But in the defensive end, and then they create those turnovers, turnovers go the other way. Aho has been there. Sveshnikov. Roslovic has played decent. Yeah. Along that top line, some of their new players on that fourth line. Blake Coleman, I like a lot. Uh, uh, or Jackson Blake. Or, or, sorry. Jackson Blake. Ja Jackson yeah. Blake, my yeah. mistake. Yeah. Uh, but they, they've they made some additions, but Rod Brindamore in that system, it just works. Uh, and it's high high intensity, high volume, never stop. And Shane Goss is fair. Give him credit. That power play was good last year. Expect maybe a dip when they lose a couple of key Pieces in the offseason bring Gosses Bear back for a second opportunity. Yeah. He's made the Well, most. he can shoot it. He, I mean, uh, that's the thing about Shane Gosses Bear. It's like we always think we're looking for perfect players all the time, right? He, there aren't very many of them. But what he does, he does very well. He can play. <laughs> he can move the puck up the ice. And he can shoot it really well. Yes, he can. And it looks, it just looks good. And it looks like the same old Carolina Hurricanes and the net mining. They got that battle, but they're going after it. And Freddie Anderson has been remarkable mm -hmm. out of the gates. Can they stay healthy? That's the question. And that's the question because Freddie Anderson not found at practice today. They've called up <laughs> Spencer Martin, so maybe it's Kochetkov tonight. We'll see. From the Canucks side of things, it's been a pretty good start for them. They had a rough outing at home to open the season against Calgary. Blew a lead, ended up losing that one in overtime. But the Vancouver Canucks now, they're trying to build on what they accomplished last year. Good heavy four checking, dump it in, dump it out style. Rick Tockett and... Says Rick Tockett and Rod Brindamore is the coaches here, right? I <laughs> yes. mean, two guys that and it does say they lot, came to play. It does say a lot, lot about coaching in this league. Does your team have an identity? Mm -hmm. Do they know who they are? Well, Carolina has for a long time. Vancouver was able to establish that last year. They're trying to follow in those same footsteps. They do have an Elias Pettersson problem. Yeah, I got a little bit him. of a struggle. I right? saw it. Got to see him up close and personal the other night against the Panthers. You got personal with him? Uh, it was personal <laughs> with the Panthers. But he's getting he's getting pushed off pucks too easy okay. and getting shoved around. Did have a goal the other night. Maybe that does spark him. They need him. Uh, yeah, desperately up front and without Thatcher Demko, 
uh, it's been, it's been okay. Yeah. Lankinen's came in, made some good saves yeah. at quality times, gave them some uh, good starts. And this Vancouver team, only one loss in regulation. This is going to be a big test on the Vancouver side yeah. to see where they stack up against a very experienced team in Carolina that knows exactly what they're doing. Yeah, so that should be a good one. Then we got another good one out west tonight, the Calgary Flames and the Vegas Golden Knights. Calgary has gotten off to a surprisingly good start, although they've had a couple of losses of late. You can see the numbers here, the season comparison between both of these teams. And... Uh, Let's start with Vegas because like that Vegas power play is clicking right now. They're giving up maybe more than we expect goal wise, but they're scoring a ton. And they, you got to see them a little bit too. The, the Vegas, their offensive zone plays when they get in the offensive end, they work it around as good as anyone. And that power play is smart. They get William Carlson back into the lineup. The additions, the defense are big, the long reach. It's really hard to get around that defensive group. And then leading by with Jack Eichel, Stone, there's that, there, that Barbershev that, on that, that line. That Those logo, guys playing well. Yes, that logo means something. What they've established in yeah. Vegas, they're not afraid to make moves, go out and change. Yeah. But that logo, when you put it on, there is something there with Vegas and what it stands for. And they've outscored their opposition 18-9 to 9 in the opening period. They come out on home ice and just pressure you, get after you, put you behind the eight ball, force you to play catch-up hockey. And when you do that... You can exploit teams offensively, and it's a pretty dynamic group and could be another favorite out there in the West. Seems like every year that they've got every time every year they've gotten in the league from they're in the mix. One, yeah, we're they talking, only missed the playoffs we're, one we're, time. We're talking about Vegas. They're in the mix. And let me ask you this, because you just said it, that 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 logo, that jersey, it means something. Is it impressive to you as a guy that played in the league for a long time? You've been reporting on the league, broadcasting for a long time now that in such a short period of time, they were able to form such a strong identity that someone like yourself is, is talking about how much of that, you know, an impact that that has for that franchise. Yeah, I'm really impressed. It, it's culture. They, yeah. they built a culture from day one. And we talk about Vegas like they've been around for 20 years. Yeah. This is year eight. Yeah. And for Vegas, when you have that kind of culture out of the gate, and Bill Foley said he wanted their owner to win a Stanley Cup by year number six. They did. And they did. Exactly that. And they had a chance in year number one. They've established themselves. They've made moves. They've been aggressive. And they've never shied away from it. I even questioned it at one time when they started making all kinds of moves and players that had been there. And I thought, this is not quite the way to go about it. They knew a lot more than I did, and that's why I'm sitting back here, yeah. and that's why they're running hockey teams, and they're, they're aggressive uh, by any kind of standard. If it feels that the coaching changes, they flip through coaches. Uh, if it's not working, they're bold. They're yeah. aggressive. And that kind of, the bold aggressiveness that you see from the front office, that's kind of what you see from the team. Yeah. It's right there. It's right into your face, and that's how they're playing hockey. Well, they'll have, uh, they should have their hands full tonight with the Calgary team that has come out of the gates Better. played very well. 0-1-1 one one their last two, but it's gotten off to a good start. They believe within that room that they're going to have uh, a better season than many think. They'll have their hands full tonight. Should be a good one out west in Vegas. The Knights and the Flames. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about the Oilers. What, what is... They got it done in OT. Leon Dreisaitl. Being the difference maker, what a surprise. Tapping one home. Talk Oilers next on First Shift. As Sider held the line, Ooh. and Dreisaitl had it blocked. Now Ekholm will try. They're in the zone. Whipped around, yeah, out of the box is Kopp, so four on four. Ekholm's in, played across, and they score! Oh to Dreisaitl, the birthday boy, ends it in overtime. Two goals, one assist in on all three, as Edmonton wins it, three to two. Happy birthday to Leon Dreisaitl, his 29th birthday, and number 29 gets the game winner in OT in Detroit, Billy. And <laughs> Second of a back-to-back -back for the Oilers tonight. They've won three in a row, playing some better hockey now. They've got the Columbus Blue Jackets tonight. Jackets have been a very competitive I, bunch so far. I'm rooting this for season. them too. Yeah, it's an emotional year. Of course, with, with absolutely, what's going on with in all Columbus, that's happened yes. in, in Columbus for sure. 
But the Oilers are a little bit back on track. We figured they would, right? Yeah, they're fine. Now, if you look at their offensive zone time, they're spending seven minutes in the offensive zone every game. That's first in the NHL. The goal is, again, plenty of chances off the rush, but only three goals. Just not the shooting percentage. Yeah, it's is low like, right now. Like, that's it, it, like Hyman isn't all, doing anything all, right now. Yeah, he had 54 goals last but year. But all, all 70 if you count the playoffs. He's going to score 40. Zach, Zach yeah. Hyman, I'm going on the limb, is going to score 40. All right. But David's going to get 120 points. Dreisaitl is going to be up around the 100, 110 point okay. mark. Uh, this Edmonton, Edmonton, Edmonton team is going to be fine. Their power play has been bad, which has been historic for the last six years. You think it's going to be bad after being historic for so long no. that it's just going to go in a tank? I think they're going to figure it out. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Once they figure out that power play, get some confidence. When you're not scoring on the power play, it kind of bleeds into what you're believing on five on five, especially with this Edmonton team. When they get touches yeah. and start feeling comfortable and it yeah. starts going in on the power play, Zach Hyman maybe gets a tap in back door on the power play, starts feeling better about his game. Everything's going to start going forward. Still some concern on defense. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe their defense is quite as stout as it was last year, but this is still, still a legitimate tough team. To yeah, yeah, I hated to see them, you know, decide not to match on Broberg. I get it. It's a salary cap league. There's certain decisions you have to make. But boy, I thought he was coming on. He's played well in St. Louis so far this year. So I do think that's where you can try to get the Oilers is on defense. Yeah, you have to attack their defense, and that is the best way to go after them. And Broberg, Broberg has made an impression. In St. Louis and Dylan Holloway, Doug Armstrong aggressive yeah. with yeah. those moves with the offer sheet. You don't see it too often. They have to replace those holes. Victor Arverson, going to have to get going a little bit. Jeff Skinner, the same thing. Jeff Skinner's never played in a playoff game over a 1,000 games. Right? We've yeah. got to get that guy in the playoffs well. to see what he can do. Uh, key cogs up front. Uh, we'll see what happens. I believe Edmonton's still a favorite to come out of the Western Conference. All right, the Oilers and the Jackets, one of eight games on the slate this evening. Billy, our time I, is on by. It just flies by. Great games tonight around the league. Looking forward to Stamp Coast <laughs> making his return in Tampa. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>